Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. It's uh, afternoon here in Munich, where I'm talking from. Maybe morning or evening, I realize, where you are, night even. Uh, anyway, um, hello, and, and thank you very much for coming to this webinar, uh, which is on the topic of navigating the course book. So we're going to be looking at uh, ways of using the course book in planning a series of lessons, um, and in particular, uh, ways of adapting or selecting from the course book to suit the particular needs of your class. Um, so here's just um, just an overview of what we're, what we're going to do in the webinar. Um, so first of all, we're going to talk in general about navigating the course book and um, some of the issues that are involved. Um, then I'm going to uh, show you an extended example of a series of lessons, which I'm taking from the second edition of uh, the course book Empower, so that we um, have something concrete to talk about. And then um, based on that, uh, we're going to be talking about particular ways in which you might adapt the course book to suit um, your, your own class and your own students. Um, so we're talking about using the course book. Uh, so perhaps a good starting place would be just to look at different attitudes to using the course book or different ways in which teachers use the course book. And here are some of them. Um, it may be that you <clears throat> um, follow the course book quite closely and um, try to cover everything in it. Uh, it may be you use the course book, but add ideas of your own or your own material. So you just use the course book as the kind of main part of your, of your material. Um, it may be that you follow the main activities in the course book, but in fact, don't have time to cover absolutely everything in the book. So you select, um, or it may be that you don't use a course book at all and you just draw on different material from different places for your classes. Um, but just pause for a moment here, just have a look at these um, four possibilities. And just decide which person do you think you're closest to? Who is most like you? Maybe a combination, of course. And feel free, if you want to, to just respond in the chat box or just think about this for a moment. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, quite a lot of mostly Bs, some Cs, some As, some one B and C, I think. Um, uh, in fact, I think this uh, webinar will mainly be relevant to you um, if, like the people who responded, uh, you are using the course book at least as your kind of main material, even if you add in other things. Although I hope the ideas will also be um, of interest to you if you are if you are a D, if you don't actually use a course book at all. But mainly, obviously, we're talking about mainly using a course book and how we might um, follow that. If we think about course books, I think there are two quite important um, factors or features of course books, um, which it's important to bear in mind. Um, one of these is that, especially I mean, modern course books, and increasingly this is the case, I think course books nowadays uh, aim to provide more than enough material for the teacher. Um, so, uh, as we know, uh, in a way, the, the student's book is like the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so, um, in addition, there are lots of other resources in, in modern course books. So there's video, there's audio, there's a workbook, an online workbook, there's a teacher's book. There are photocopyable resources with um, extra speaking activities if you want them. There's extra reading if you need it. Uh, there are tests or assessment packages with progress tests and uh, end of course tests and so on. And there is also there are also resources for the teacher um, like Presentation Plus, which allows you to project parts of the book um, onto the onto the whiteboard and so on. 
Um, so in power's second condition, um, this is true of that, and it's true of most course books as well, I think. So there's, there's plenty of material available for the teacher. And um, a second feature, which I think is quite important, is that um, course books these days are usually designed to be taught off the page. In other words, in the student's book, the whole lesson is there. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of preparation time um, working out how to teach the material. Um, it's more or less there for you. If you want it to be, um, you can more or less go into the class with, with not too much preparation time and use the book as it is. I think um, both these features of course books are generally positive because um, I think they, um, they give lots of support to the teacher, but inevitably they also have a downside, don't they? So um, the problem is that I think then teachers might feel that they're a bit dominated by the course book um, and they don't have enough space to, uh, to bring in enough of their own personality into the lesson or to do things in their own way. And so I think it's extremely important to be aware of the fact that, um, at least I think in a in a, um, in a face to face lesson anyway, I'm not sure if it applies so much to to online teaching, but in a face to face lesson, the main relationship in the classroom um, it should be um, between the teacher and the students and the students and each other. So this kind of three way relationship, and that the course book is really just a tool. Um, it's a a resource to be drawn on. Um, rather than, which I think can happen, that the course book tends to be the main thing in the lesson and has the relationship with the students. And the teacher is left sort of at the side as not much more than the manager. So he's just saying, kind of, turn to page 86, exercise six. Uh, it's a very easy role for the teacher to have, but not a very satisfactory role um, for the teacher. Um, and is not really, in my opinion, very desirable. So in this webinar, um, I think part of what we'll be talking about is ways of navigating through the course book in a way that maintains this relationship um, between you and your students and just draws on the course book as a resource. So keeps that relationship. OK, in thinking about um, navigating the course book and how what the options might be, um, I think there are, there are a number of, of issues uh, which underlie the kind of choices you might make about how to navigate the course book. Um, one of these, obviously, is time. So it may be that um, you don't have time to do everything uh, in the course. You don't have um, time enough in the lesson um, or that your students don't have time to do um, much work outside the lesson. So you have to do everything in the lesson. Um, with no, op no option for self-study. Um, another issue might be uh, the needs and the profile of your learners. So, uh, for example, your, your learners um, may, may want to do a lot of speaking, um, but not much reading and listening. Or um, you may have an exam class where it's extremely important to do lots of grammar and practice and consolidation, but speaking may not be so important. Or you may have a class um, for whom writing and reading is important because they're, they're, they're planning to um, take a course of study or they're, they're planning to use English professionally. Um, so these might be factors which underlie um, the way you decide to navigate through the course. Um, and the third issue, which is really what we, we were talking about just now, uh, is the role of the teacher and, and your, how, how much you appear in the lesson. Uh, and I think it may be that you want to adapt the course book or select from the course book so that you can personalize the material and bring something of yourself into the, into the class. Um, and in this, in this webinar, this will, I mean, these three issues will really underlie quite a lot of the, um, the things we'll be talking about, about ways in which you might select and adapt material. Okay. Um, if you're thinking about um, ways to suit the material to your particular needs and the needs of your class, um, clearly there are various ways in which you might approach the material and, and adapt it um, and choices you might make. Um, 
It might be that you would choose to, to cut material or reduce it or select it. Um, for example, you might choose to cut out a whole activity or even a whole part of a unit or maybe just one exercise or part of an exercise. Um, you might choose to add material. So you might um, add pictures, for example, um, add, um, add, uh, um, add a leading activity of your own, add a discussion. Um, you might add a whole text. You might change or adapt the material. Um, so you might decide to do, to do an activity in a slightly different way. Um, you might decide to give your own sort of presentation. Uh, and you might actually replace material. So you might decide not to use an exercise in the book, but take in an exercise from somewhere else, for example. Um, and all these um, different options, of course, they could operate on um, what you might think of as a kind of macro level. Um, in other words, you might decide to select or add or change um, complete sections of the course book um, or major activities or major or whole texts. Or they might operate on a more micro level where you might, might make sort of smaller changes to the balance of the exercises or the activities. Um, mainly, we'll be focusing on this kind of more micro level of adapting the course, um, mainly because I think it, well, it's easier to talk about within the scope of this webinar. And also, I think it's um, possibly more difficult to take decisions um, on that sort of level. It's obviously very easy to decide, well, okay, I'll leave out a whole lesson or, or, um, or, or, um, or a whole text than it is to make a smaller scale change. So mainly we'll be talking about smaller scale changes within particular activities or exercises. Okay, um, another thing to bear in mind, I think, when thinking about how to adapt the course book and what sort of ways of selecting and changing the material is that certain things are gonna be easy to do. Certain changes are quite easy to make by the teacher. And I think other changes are more difficult to make or um, are maybe more time consuming to make. And I'd just like to pause at this point before we go any further um, and ask you to do a task here. So here are some things that you might add. We're talking about mainly adding material here, okay, that you might add to the lessons in the course book. Which of these do you think would be easy for the teacher to add? And which of them do you think might be more difficult to add? I'll just pause at this point and just, just um, think about this. And again, if you like, by all means, respond in the, in the chat box. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your responses. Um, I think I agree with you. I must say. Obviously, there's no right or wrong answer. It depends what you know what you're good at doing. But um, this would be my answer to this. Um, I think, as many of you have commented in the chat box, I think that the first three are relatively difficult and time-consuming things to do. Um, so, writing a writing a practice exercise, I think, is actually quite difficult um, to make it to make one that works well and does the things you want it to do. Of course, you could always lift one from some other place, but then it might not be exactly suitable for what you need. Um, I think finding suitable texts um, is also quite time consuming. In writing Empower, we spent a very long time in selecting texts, finding, making sure they're the right level, um, making sure they're interesting and the right length and included the right language and so on. So I think this is an area where probably what's provided in the course book um, is more likely to be usable than what you could easily come up with yourself. Um, obviously, looking for authentic text becomes much easier at higher levels, but it's quite difficult at lower levels, I would say. Um, and I also think that writing tests, well, we all know that I mean, test writing 
is a profession in itself. So this is, this is also quite a difficult thing to do, to get a test, to write a test that really works. But I think um, the other things, um, four to seven, are relatively easy for the teachers to do. And in some ways, I think that they are things which the teacher can very usefully contribute to the lesson because the teacher can often do them more easily, um, not sorry, not more easily, but more flexibly um, and perhaps better in some ways than the course book can. Um, so in this webinar, um, the, the, the kind of options we'll be looking at will be um, mainly ones, I hope anyway, which are fairly easy to implement and their adaptations which are fairly feasible to make without a huge amount of extra, extra work before the lesson. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do now then is just um, show you an example of a series of lessons. Um, this is taken from Empower Second Edition from the upper intermediate level. Um, and the reason we're doing this is so that we have something sort of concrete to talk about. Um, and I'd just like to, to take you through um, what happens here. What this is, is not the whole unit. Um, every unit is in four sections. So there's A, B, C, and D. And as you can see, um, the unit begins with a preliminary activity based on a photograph. So what, we, what I'm going to take you through is just the first section of this, which would make up probably about two or three lessons, depends how long your lessons are, maybe two to three hours of teaching, something like that. Um, uh, so as you can see, it, um, it starts off with a preliminary activity based on a photograph where students um, talk about what's going on in the photograph, which generally introduces the topic of the unit. Um, and then this first part of the unit, okay, so this is the second page you can see here. Um, uh, you can see here that, um, okay, um, in this part, learn, um, learners learn to discuss events that change their lives and um, compare the past and the present with a particular grammatical focus on used to and would and the vocabulary of um, expressions of cause and result. And this begins with um, a lead in, a speaking activity, which introduces the topic of this part, which is about um, millionaires, very rich people, and the discussion of um, people they know who are, who are millionaires um, and whether they spend their money wisely. Elon Musk springs to mind here maybe others as well. Um, and then they imagine if they're a millionaire, what, what would they do with their money? So a kind of general speaking lead in. Then there is a reading activity, um, which is a parallel reading, a jigsaw reading. So um, uh, there are two texts about both about some um, people who um, went from poverty to extreme riches. And um, some students read one text, some students read the other, and they get together and they retell uh, what they have read. But before they do that, as you can see, there's the beginning of the two texts, which everybody looks at. So this is the beginning of a text about um, a, a, an Indian boy who went to uh, London and then became a millionaire by starting a drinks company selling traditional Indian drinks. And this is the beginning of a text about Mark Pearson, who, um, let's call left school at 16, um, didn't have a very promising future, and then um, made a huge amount of money by selling uh, discount vouchers online. So they're both regs to riches stories. Um, and students read the beginning of these, and then there is a prediction activity where they see keywords from the two stories, and they predict, they guess what the stories are going to be about. So they do this together. Then some students um, in D, read one story, some students read another story, and they answer questions on it. And then in E, they get together with, with a new partner, so one A and one B, and they retell their story, and they tell each other what their story was about, and they work out similarities and differences between them. Okay, so jigsaw reading activity. This leads on, on the next page, to a grammar focus. Um, using examples from the stories and focusing on used to and would. And you see there, there's a kind of guided discovery activity about that. Then there is a second language focus, a second grammar focus, which is on a related area of grammar, not any more and not any longer. And that takes us to the end of the kind of first part of this. Then there's practice um, of this grammar. 
then there is a listening to um, the students listen to an interview, um, a researcher talking about the psychology of money um, and whether money and sudden wealth makes you happy or not. I'm just going to play you a, a very short extract from this just so that you can uh, get an impression of what happens here. So does suddenly having a lot of money really influence people's behaviour? Or are these just isolated or unusual cases which make a good story? They're just isolated cases. In fact, winning doesn't usually have a negative influence on people. Of course, people like to believe that winning money leads to disaster because that makes them feel better about not winning. But the idea that winning a lot of money causes misery is actually a myth. It's simply not true. There have been studies done on this, haven't there? Yes, that's right. According to most studies, suddenly having a lot of money is just as likely to have a positive effect on you as a negative effect. And most people don't, in fact, spend all their money. Can you give us some examples? Yes. For example, a recent study in Britain looked at how much of their money people spent if they won the lottery. Okay. And so it goes on. She talks about research that has been done into this area um, of the psychology of, of money, of being rich. Um, so then um, no questions on that. This leads into, on the next page, um, a vocabulary focus which focuses on um, expressions for cause and result, um, like lead to, causes, is caused by, have an effect on, and so on. And then there is practice, as you see down the column, I won't zoom in on it, uh, um, of this language, of this vocabulary. Then in section six, there is a shorter piece of listening, which is a, um, a kind of listening model in a way for the final activity. Um, students hear people talking about how their lives have changed, and then there is a final speaking activity where students talk about how their lives have changed, things they used to do that they no longer do, and how things are now different. And as you can see, there's, there, there's a preparation time, they make some brief notes, and they talk to each other about, about this. So that's the sequence of, um, of activity. I'm just a, to, here's a, a very quick summary of it. So it goes from a lead in with a discussion to an initial speaking activity. Um, then there is a parallel reading, the students read two stories, then a focus on grammar, listening to an interview, a focus on vocabulary and practice of that, then a short listening model, which leads to a final speaking activity. Um, okay, an important thing to say at this point is, of course, it might be that this just suits the way your class is. In other words, you have time to do all these things. This is the, um, the balance of activities is more or less right for your students. And in fact, you could just go in and teach it as it is. I mean, this was, was also our intention in writing um, the activity. But of course, it may be that um, the particular needs of your students um, or your all, all the time is slightly different from this. And so you might want to make um, adaptations. And this is what we're going to look at now. Um, we're going to look at some various options so, for example, let's start off thinking about things you might cut or reduce. This is one possibility. You have no time to cover everything and you want to maximize the speaking time in the lesson. Um, so what you might do then is um, reduce or um, reduce the reading or use the reading before the lesson for students to do at home. So um, before the lesson, students um, read the text. You can still preserve it as a um, as a parallel reading activity, as a jigsaw reading. Some students read text A, some students read text B, and then in the lesson they come together and they just do the speaking part. So they just do this part of the lesson um, where they retell their stories. So the focus is on the speaking in class, but they read at home. Um, Clearly, there are good reasons for doing reading in the lesson, if you have time to do that, I think. I mean, it's a good way to develop um, particular skills and strategies like skimming, scanning. It also makes reading a corroborative activity. But there are also, I think, good reasons for doing reading before the lesson. Um, one is it allows more class time for speaking. Um, also, I think homework done before the lesson, in my experience, is often more motivating than setting homework after the lesson as an extension. Um, because students have an aim, they know what they're preparing for, um, they want to be ready for the lesson. 
And I think this helps in mixed ability classes. I think we all have this experience of um, sometimes um, where you have a, a, a striking difference in reading speed between different students in your class, especially mixed nationality classes. This is a problem um, where um, the, 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 uh, either you wait for the slower students um, and the, the, the faster readers um, are hanging around or um, the slower students get bogged down and never finish the text. So I think this can be very helpful for, for weaker students to just have time to read, to read the text in their own time before the lesson. Um, it may be, of course, that um, your students don't have time to do reading outside the class. They don't have self-study time. So another option here, I think, is actually to just reduce the reading text. Um, so students could just read one of the texts um, and the other one could be given as an optional homework. Um, you could still preserve this as a, uh, as a jigsaw reading. So you could divide one text in, uh, into half. Group A reads one text, uh, one half, sorry. Group B reads the other half and then they, they get together and they tell each other the half that they've read. And I think you can do this with, very often do this with text that you use in the lesson to reduce the amount of time that they take. So that might be one kind of cut you make or reduction. Um, the same sort of thing applies, I think, to listening. I mean, you might decide that you don't have time to do listening in the class, or perhaps um, that listening is a, a, a difficult activity to manage in your class because of you have a mixed ability class and so this could also be done before the lesson um, for example the interview we looked at students could listen to the interview and then in the class maybe you just play it once to check um, but then you move straight on to the vocabulary focus that follows it on cause and results um, again, like in reading, I think there are good reasons for doing listening in class. Um, it, it's a good way to make listening a cooperative activity, and you can do things to support the listening, as we know, and stage the listening. But I think there are also good reasons to do listening at home before the lesson. Um, and one is, I think it's a more relaxed activity. It allows students to, um, to listen as many times as they like. Um, and because of that, I think it helps to develop listening skills, um, especially these, um, these bottom-up skills, um, recognition skills, kind of playing things again and again, making sure that you really get what people are saying, I think is quite a valuable thing for students to do and can be best done probably on their own. Um, again, it's good for mixed ability classes. Um, listening can often be difficult to manage if um, if you have some much weaker students who simply don't get what the listening was about even after you've played it twice in the class so it's helpful for them and i think also it's quite easy to organize these days because um, because you can quite easily give students files to listen to on mobile phones it used to be much more difficult when you had cds and you had to copy them so it's an easy thing to do and is a way to save time in the lesson. Sorry. Um, okay, that's reading and listening. Um, it may be that you, another way of cutting the, the, the material, you want to spend less time on free fluency activities. Um, usually it's the other way around. I think often teachers want to spend more time on speaking and fluency, but it may be you have, for example, um, a weaker class who find it difficult. Um, that um, don't respond very well to so just speaking freely and you want to spend more time doing more controlled practice, more supportive practice, for example. Um, so it's very easy to simply cut out or reduce some of the freer activities in the lessons. Um, if we look at the, um, the example here, um, there are in fact many places where there are opportunities for, for fluency. Um, at the beginning of the lesson, the initial discussion, um, the, the initial speaking activity here about millionaires, about people being rich, again, a discussion. Um, before the reading, there is this prediction activity, where there's an opportunity again for discussion. Um, there's the reading and retelling itself, which is also a flu um, develops fluency, telling stories. After the grammar, this leads to a freer activity. So there's an opportunity there. Um, after the listening, um, students respond to what they hear. There's a discussion about whether they agree or not. Uh, after the vocabulary, there is another free activity where students talk about um, events that change their lives. And of course, right at the end, uh, there is the major free activity uh, in which students talk about how they have changed. Um, and of course, it would be very easy to, to reduce or cut out all or some of the, or most of these activities. For example, you could leave out um, the initial, the opening activity 
altogether if you wanted to save time and spend less time on fluency. I think if I were using these this material, these activities, um, I would not want to cut out or reduce these two activities because these seem to be very important. So the, um, um, the, the, the retelling of the stories, I think, is an integral part of this jigsaw reading activity and a very powerful way to develop fluency. Um, and also the activity at the end, this is where everything comes together and in some ways is the most important activity of the unit, because um, this is the point where we see whether students can really use the language that we've been teaching them. Um, so I would see that I would see those as essential to keep, but it would be easy enough to, to reduce or omit some of the others. Um, a more likely thing, I'm moving from cutting now to adding material, um, you might want to do, you might want to give more emphasis to fluency activities, um, um, especially if you have a class where maybe, maybe um, you want students to become more fluent, they need this, or maybe it's a class where students don't want to focus so much on grammar, but they want to have lots of practice in speaking. Um, an easy way to add in the fluency activities is simply to add a new activity. And if you remember this iceberg um, we looked at um, at the beginning, um, it's very easy to draw on the extra resources which are available. So in Empower, for example, um, for every grammar area and every, uh, every vocabulary area, uh, there is a photocopy of an activity. Here is an example. Um, you could do this as a mingling activity, probably a class survey. So you could find out who in the class used to be good at sports at school. This is all about things when you're at school. And this would give further um, kind of communication games, um, semi-controlled practice, communicative practice of the language. So that's one thing you might do is add, a, add an activity. But I think another quite interesting way of um, giving more emphasis to fluency is to add more stages to the activities that are already there um, in the lesson. So, for example, um, if we look at this final speaking activity where students talk about um, how they have changed, um, the way this would be, I mean, simply following the book as it is on the page, um, it's really a three phase or three stage activity, isn't it? So there's a preparation stage where students think about it and make notes. Then there's an interaction stage where they get together in pairs or groups, maybe, and they talk to each other. Um, and then probably there's a kind of feedback or roundup stage where um, you ask students what they found out from their partner or something like that. And the activity would probably um, take maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes perhaps, maybe five minutes for each, each stage. Um, it may be though that you want to expand this and make it into a longer activity with more fluency. And there are, there are several different ways you could do this. Um, here's one way you could um, get them to repeat the task. So um, there's a preparation stage, then they get to the other pairs and talk about it. Then students move to a new partner and have a second conversation or they could have a third conversation as well. Um, and then at the end, you get feedback. Okay, which, which of the people you talk to was uh, most like you, for example. Um, another possibility would be to, after the preparation stage, students talk in pairs, then the pairs get together in larger groups and they, um, they compare notes about what they talked about. And then you have a feedback stage about, you get people to, to summarize some of the things they talked about in their group. Uh, or it could, of course, be a mingling activity. So students prepare and make notes, then they all move around the class and interact with two or three or more other students. And then the feedback stage is what they found out from the people they talked to. So all these are different ways of repeating the task um, and extending the activity so it becomes more like a maybe a 20 minute or 25 minute activity rather than the 10 to 15 minutes activity. Um, why do this? I think there are, some very, there are very good reasons for doing this. Um, one is obviously it increases the amount of, of interaction between the students, increases talking time. More importantly though, I think it's a very powerful way to develop fluency because of course, um, when, they, when they come to talk to repeating the task, when they do it a second time or a third time, they get better at doing it. I mean, they, they've got in their heads what they want to say and they can expand, they can, they can enrich what they say. Uh, a lot of research has been done into this um, about how repeating tasks leads to greater complexity and greater fluency. 
Um, so it's a way to not just practice speaking, but actually to develop speaking fluency. And of course, it also helps with the social relationships in the class. Um, if students are interacting with, with several different people, they get to know each other in the class much better. Um, we talked about various skills. We haven't talked about writing at all, um, but it may be that in your class you want to add more writing. It may be your class is, um, um, is uh, preparing for um, doing a course of study, for example, so they need um, sort of general academic skills. It may be they're going to need writing um, professionally. Uh, it may be simply that their writing skills aren't very good. Or, you know, it's a weak point and you want to give them more opportunity to do writing or perhaps the students want that. Um, so various reasons why you want to include more writing. Uh, one way to do this um, would be um, to actually include a, a writing activity. And in Empower, I mean, the example we looked at didn't have much writing in it, um, but the last part of every unit is the focus is on writing. So this is the D lesson of the ABCD. Um, and this is an example from um, the unit we've been looking at. Um, and you can see there's a series of activities here, speaking, listening, reading, but leading up to writing in which students write um, uh, an online application for a job as a student guide, a student buddy. Um, and the writing skill is to give a positive impression in an application about themselves. Um, so this is something, if, if this is relevant to your students' needs, you might do this. Um, um, or if it's not relevant, um, your students don't need it, you might leave it out. So there's, a, there's an obvious flexibility here, an easy choice to make. Um, this is an example of what I, I like to think of as some kind of big writing. In other words, um, it's a major writing activity which would take up quite a lot of, a le of lesson time, might be a complete lesson with preparation, um, with staged stages in the writing, um, pro some process writing, with redrafting, and so on, uh, and um, or might lead to a kind of major piece of writing done at home. But in addition to this, um, I think it's useful also to think of um, what you might think of as small writing. In other words, just a shorter writing phase in the lesson. Um, and it's quite easy to add writing of this kind into the lesson. Um, here's an example. Um, let's look again at the speaking activity we were talking about earlier. Um, you might want to shift the focus of this away from speaking and onto writing. Um, and so instead of just writing very brief notes in preparation, students could write complete sentences or they could write a whole paragraph, perhaps. And then this could be the basis of the speaking activity. So they show what they've written and they answer questions about it and a discussion comes out of this. So the focus shifting more onto the writing. Um, I think there are several advantages of doing this from time to time. Um, it changes the pace of the lesson. It gives a kind of slower pace where there's a bit of thinking time for learners. Um, it's also, I think, an important chance for, um, for you as the teacher to, to just check what they're doing, to check accuracy. Have they really understood the language? Can they use the language accurately or not. Um, and it's also, I think, also a very, it helps with speaking fluency because students have taken time to think about it, um, to write sentences about it. So they've got this kind of basis on which to speak, um, which of course helps them to speak more fluently. Um, before this webinar, I wrote it out um, to help me to speak. And I think there's a very similar kind of process. Um, very important here, the point of this writing is not to give to the teacher it's to prepare for, for a speaking activity. This might be another thing you might want to do is um, give more consolidation and control practice. Um, it may be, maybe you have a, a weaker class perhaps who need more consolidation, um, especially of grammar. It may be that students, um, maybe an exam class, students need, need grammar and practice of this kind. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> what you might do is you might do more controlled practice in class. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, the, um, in addition to the student's book, in most course books, there's a lot of resource material. Um, and very often it includes controlled practice, which I think is quite easy to bring into the lesson. Um, here is an example from Empower. At the back of the book, um, there is a grammar focus page um, for every grammar presentation and um, it gives a summary of the unit 
This is something I think I'll give the students to look at at home. I wouldn't do this in class normally. But there are also some controlled practice exercises. And it might be that you would choose to bring one of these or both of them and actually do them as a controlled practice stage in the lesson. If that was what you thought was useful and needed by your students. Um, advantages for doing this, I mean, I think often we tend to assign these sort of things for homework. It's the kind of thing we think, well, students can do this on their own, um, which is true. Uh, but I think there are advantages to doing them in the lesson as well. One is that students can work together, so it becomes a cooperative activity. Um, strong students can help weak students and so on. Um, also, I think it is a chance for the teacher to pick up on language points so you can see, you know, what are they getting wrong? What are they getting right? What might you need to kind of reteach um, in the lesson? So I think this is quite a useful um, element in it as well. So quite an easy addition to make to the lesson, I would say. Okay, um, the examples we've looked at so far, thinking back to these issues I mentioned at the beginning um, of this uh, webinar, uh, the examples we um, looked at so far um, have been mainly concerned with um, either time um, and issues of sort of how much time you have available in the lesson or how much time students have outside the lesson um, and also with adapting the materials to the particular needs of a particular class or the profile of your learners. Um, the last example I'd like to show you is um, addresses this um, last issue, which we talked about earlier, which is the role of the teacher um, and maintaining your relationship in the class and bringing more of yourself into the lesson. And um, for example, it may be that um, you want to personalize the lesson more. You want to get away from the book, um, bring more of your, your own personality into the class. And in particular, in the presentation of, of the new language, the presentation of the grammar, you might want to present the language in your own way. Um, so I'd like to just have a look at a couple of ways of doing this. One easy way to do it, I think, is um, instead of just sticking with the book, is to go away from the book and show examples on the board and elicit the rules of the grammar yourself by asking questions. So let's just have a look at um, the grammar presentation here. As you see in the book, um, it takes examples from the text, from the reading, and then there's a kind of guided discovery um, where students look at it and they fill gaps about the use and form of used to and would. Now you could do it like this, but you could also, at this point, just go away from the book, put these examples on the board instead, and ask questions to elicit the rules instead. So um, my father used to travel for his work. You'd ask questions like, well, you know, does he still travel? No, he doesn't. Um, did he travel before? Yes, he did. So this establishes that used to um, is used for things that were true in the past, but are not true now. So in other words, you do it, you do the same thing as in the book, but you just do it in your own way. Um, and I think the advantage of doing this is that there is much more interaction between you and the class. So instead of this being kind of heads down in the book and you just organizing it, students are heads up, they're responding to you. Um, and it enables you to adapt to the level of the class more. It enables you to judge what they know, what they don't know, what you might need to go through especially. Do you need to give more examples and so on? So it's, it's a more flexible way, I think, of using the material. Um, of course, you could then go back to the book and use that as a consolidation um, for this. Um, that's one option. Um, a more radical way of personalizing this, I think, might be you might decide, well, at this point, you might go away from, the, from what's in the book altogether, and you might give your own examples of used to and would, and you might give your own personal context. Um, so um, you might tell them something about yourself. For example, I'd like to tell you about the time when I was a student, I used to stay in bed, blah, blah, blah. some days I get up about lunchtime, uh, I'd have about eight cups of coffee, and then I used to stay up very late and so on. So your own examples about your own life using the target grammar. Um, uh, we looked at this as an example at the beginning, and one of you in the chat column um, said you thought this was an easy thing to do. Um, I agree with you. I think it is quite an easy thing for teachers to do, and I think it has quite a lot of advantages. Um, it makes the lesson much more personal. 
um, and in, in, in many ways more interesting. Um, I hope that these texts about millionaires are interesting, so they're interesting to read, but I think you and your own life are even more interesting. So I think students generally find the teacher's life something that is very interesting and um, it's simply more personal and alive. Uh, and doing this also, of course, means there is interaction between the teacher and the students. The students are, are sitting up, they're looking at you, they're responding to you and so on, rather than with their heads down in the book. Um, and as I just said, it's, I think, relatively easy to do. Uh, in Munich, one of the things I do here is um, I do fairly basic level teacher training, salsa courses uh, with inexperienced teachers. And we encourage our teachers to do to do uh, to give context like this. And one thing I've noticed is that even completely inexperienced teachers who have never taught before um, actually find this quite easy to do, to give little context of their own. And it's something they find quite rewarding to do as well. So I think this is a, this is a good departure from the book. Um, and again, of course, you can come back to the book and use the examples in the book as consolidation. So it may be an alternative, um, but um, not necessarily replacing what is in the book. Okay, so um, we've looked at a kind of range of possible options for um, reducing and cutting material, for adapting material, for adding material over a series of lessons. Um, and I think just to, just to summarize, just to bring this together, um, here are some of the questions which I think it might be quite useful to consider um, when deciding what you might do, how to navigate the course book. Um, one is, well, what do your students need the most? So what are you going to prioritize? What is maybe less important for the learners um, or indeed for you as a teacher? Um, and so what do they say they want or don't want to do? Um, uh, what can I spend less time or more time on in the lesson? And also, what can students do outside the lesson? So what options do I have there to move material into self-study? Um, and especially nowadays, with, when a lot of teaching is online, there may be a lot of possibilities for kind of flipping the lesson in that way. And finally, the last thing we looked at, how can I add more of myself to the course book? So um, increase my own role as a teacher in the lesson. And that brings us to the end of um, of this webinar. So thank you very much for, for listening. And also um, those of you who responded in the chat, um, uh, thank you very much for, for, for your responses as well. Um, we've, got, we've still got some time for questions. I've gone a tiny bit over, over time, um, but I hope there's time to ask some questions. So thank you very much. That's fine. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Uh, just a couple of questions in so far. If you want to write another question, please do that. Please put it in the, in the Q&A box. Um, I think your last slide an answered one of the questions, which was sort of where where does it where does a teacher start? Um, and I do like the the sort of looking to your students for that because those are the ones that obviously are benefiting from this. So would you start perhaps with a needs analysis or a you know how much does a teacher decide if they if they're squeezed for time? You know what what do I focus on here? Yeah. You know what's the starting point? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. I mean, I think this depends a lot on the kind of class you're teaching. Um, if you have the possibility to decide your own your own syllabus or your own material, um, then I think, you know, then obviously a needs analysis would be extremely useful. And I would then find, you know, the first thing I do, for example, a business class, find out what the students want to do, what they need to do. Um, very often, I think in general classes, um, you may not have that option because you have a syllabus to follow anyway. Um, so it may be a little bit beyond your control. Um, if it's not, and you do have those options, yes, I, th I think it's extremely important for this to come from the learners. Um, and I think, you know, rather than just making your own judgment, um, see what they want to do. I think the, the maybe, um, there, may be a conf there may be a conflict or there may be a difference in this. Um, for example, I know of... Um, um, one one um, teaching that I, I observed, I didn't teach it myself, was with uh, um, uh, pension and senior citizens um, in, um, in Germany, who um, uh, the teacher noticed that their grammar was very weak, but the students thought that they didn't want to do any grammar at all, all they wanted, all they wanted to do was speak. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a situation like that, you might make a compromise between what you notice and what they want. <laughs> exactly that is a, a very but in general point. i think yes the starting point should be them what they think they need. 
Excellent. And another question here from, from Olga. Um, I'm in, in a mixed ability class. What, what's the optimal number of hours to cover everything in one unit? Now that's, uh, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you would answer that, but it, there's a lot of factors coming into play there. Yeah. Um, I think it's, a, I find this a very difficult question to answer because I think, um, you know, it, I mean, I know it's not a good answer, but in fact, it's the right answer. It's probably what it depends so much on. It depends on how you navigate through the course book and, you know, what things you prioritize and what things maybe you can assign for doing at home. So it's a different length of time if everything is going to be going on in the lesson from if the students have self-study time. I think that's one thing. Um, and it may be, for example, that you don't do certain activities such as, you know, the major writing activity. But if you just follow, I mean, just assuming you follow everything, you do everything in the, in the unit, um, I would say um, just from what I've observed in lessons using Empower, um, that each part so this part A would be, I would say, two to three hours of teaching time. Okay, so maybe two yeah. lessons, depends on your lesson. Um, so if you add that up, the whole unit is going to be um, uh, about eight or nine hours of teaching. Um, I don't know if this is the official amount, but that would sound about right to me. I, th um, I think you say something like, um, hopefully get this right, about 90 hours for a whole yeah. Book. Um, so you're looking at sort of oh yeah nine per per unit. Nine. Like that. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah. That's pretty. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think you know if I was teaching the book, I would add into that um, you know time to do consolidation, time to do um, you know to go over things. Um, but on the other hand, I might subtract time for things that I decide to just leave out. Yeah. Yeah. What What about um, you mentioned about the, about the homework as well? So it, is there an optimal? amount of time for that i mean too much could turn the students off they don't want to do it is it better to do 10 minutes instead of 30 minutes or you know what, what do you give your students to, to yeah. try and get them to study outside a classroom yeah classroom? yeah i think um i mean you know i think these days when a lot of the teaching is probably done online or more teaching is done online than before because of, of COVID, of course, um, this balance actually shifts. So I think a lot of what students may be doing is outside the class, but in a normal sort of face-to-face -face class, um, yes, I think I, I would normally tend to kind of keep, keep homework. Um, I would say keep homework as the minimum. And I think, you know, there is also the workbook and the online workbook, which provides useful self-study activities. So I think I would be a little bit careful about not adding to that too much because it's giving simply too much. Um, that's one reason I was suggesting the idea of, of preparation, pre oh, sorry, preparation homework, um, where you, know, you just say to students, well, you know, before this lesson, you know, tr have, have, a, have a listen to the, to the recording, because I think that's the kind of homework that, that students can do. I mean, it's not such a chore. It's probably something a bit yeah. more interesting, and they can do it on the bus or whatever, you know, probably, yeah. goes, probably goes to the class. <laughs> But um, so I think that combination of maybe sort of workbook for ordinary homework, but also some reading and listening as a kind of preparation for the lesson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I suppose as well, that if they're studying online and you're making them do more things online, there's a, a fatigue aspect that could creep into that as well. Uh, yeah. Because if it's if it's face to face and then you're asking them to do something online, that's a bit mixed. That's that's probably a bit more, um, you know, a bit yeah. more interesting for them. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I liked your, I, I didn't even think of this, the shorter writing, because um, when I used to teach, you know, you said to you, say to your students, we're going to do some writing now, and most people go, ooh. So yeah. I, I do like the idea, <laughs> the idea of, a, of a, you know, just, just make them do something rather than nothing, some sort of yeah. shorter uh, writing activities, which, which obviously helps if you're pressed for time as well. But I think it helps perhaps for motivation uh, mm. Well, I agree. Something which sorry, we, do, we do a lot in self actually, and I do a lot in my lessons is, you know, just sort of write, write, write down two questions to ask your partner, that kind of writing. Yeah. You know, doesn't e teachers doesn't even ever need to see it necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of ways if, it, if generally teachers are very good at coming up with their own ideas and adding mm -hmm. to the material. But yeah, if you, if you have quite a lot of things to choose from, it can be a bit overwhelming at the start and you literally do have to navigate through the course but which, which bits do i do i choose which bits do i pick so you have given some some very good examples about how to uh, uh, reduce um reduce that um any other questions in nothing in there's, there's one which i quite liked it wasn't 
much to do with navigating, of course, but I, I quite like the question. It says, uh, the person asked anonymously, do you speak German, Adrian? And I, I know you do. Uh, uh, yes. and, it, <laughs> and they ask, um, does it help you plan um, with, uh, you know, uh, writing the activities and, and planning uh, things for others, for students of English? Um, in my, uh, I'm not quite sure. Because in you speak in another my, language. In, in so my, you're, you're in looking my at it. Yeah. Yeah, when you're writing the book, you're looking writing, at it. In writing you, the book, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the uh, activities that you plan, perhaps. Um, yes, I think it definitely does, actually. Um, I mean, I think maybe not German specifically, um, because, of course, the book is, is sort of, you know, for many language backgrounds. Yeah. Um, but certainly, I think knowing another language um, is absolutely invaluable. I mean, I mean certainly for teaching. But also for writing, um, because you can kind of imagine, what, you know, what the problem, what the problems might be. I mean, what you know, what, what students might might need much better. Yeah. There was a question. I don't know if we can put into the into the chat box the the um, link to the second Empower Second Edition. And mm. um, there was a question about the the first and second edition. But I think there's lots of new content in there, lots of new images, because um, people are saying, what's the difference between the, the first and second edition? Yeah. So, um, Please go to the to the web hub, um, and I think uh, just see if uh, Katie can put that in now. If not, I'll do it in a second. Um, uh, go and have a look at the web hub. Have a have a look at the uh, the contents. If you're not familiar with the course as well, um, the examples uh, shown today by Adrian were from that course, and it is packed full of uh, lots of lots of good stuff in there. Um, and we now have the addition of our new platform, Cambridge One. So uh, anything uh, digital, the digital workbook, um, the tests as well, those inbuilt tests for, for kind of motivational purposes. So you, you do have the option within Power where, um, uh, you know, you can, you can evaluate how, how well your students are doing to see which areas perhaps you need to give them more work on or, or you know, which which skills you need to focus in more it's a it's a good tool the assessment tool for doing that as well it, it would guide a, guide a teacher to some extent wouldn't it Adrian? yeah yeah it would absolutely yeah 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 i think the the, the website is very it gives a very clear picture actually of what's um what's what's new what's changed and what the features are hmm. Excellent. So we've got, yeah, we've got the link in, in, in the site now. It's uh, yeah. the easy one. It's uh, cambridge.org slash empower. Um, and we're very nearly out of time. So we'll be putting in the link so you can get your uh, certificates of, of attendance as well. Um, and with my voice going, actually, and with one minute, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there today. Um, but thank you very much. There we go. The link's in, in the chat box now for you. Uh, thank you very much uh, again, Adrian. Thanks, everybody. Okay for attending these, um, uh, these talks, whether you're live right here and right now, or whether you're watching again later on, we know a lot of people uh, also do that. We do appreciate you coming along. And uh, that's all from Cambridge and from uh, Germany. Yep, okay, okay. Thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks again very much for, um, for attending, um, for attending the session. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>